Right guys, how's it going? This video is kind of a continuation of the last video, which was my benchmark video, what benchmark to trust. And I talked about one or two things there. For example, how reviewers really need to create a winner and a bunch of other stuff as well. But one thing that I really wanted to talk about was just how reliable are these benchmarks? Here's the thing. Every reviewer believes that they are doing the best benchmarks. <laughs> Everybody. But that simply cannot be the case. And in my 1800X review, I had one or two comments saying, look, you're GPU bound. That's why you're getting the results you're getting. Whereas other reviewers are getting wildly different results. Now, the truth of the matter is, the best graphics card I got was MSI's GTX 1070 Gaming, which is definitely mid-range now. I mean, you've got Titan X's, you've got the 1080 Ti, must be, what, 50% faster? Something like that anyway. So obviously you are less likely to hit that GPU bottleneck with a much faster graphics card. And so I dug around a bit, I found an interesting post on Reddit showing the wildly different results in one game in particular, Rise of the Tomb Raider. Now I had actually decided to benchmark Tomb Raider before this, but I found this very interesting. In most cases the 7700K had a pretty large win in fact, even over 30% in some cases. Again, different settings tested, different areas, even different versions of DirectX. But also more importantly, these guys are all bigger than me and they've got much faster graphics cards, 1080 being the slowest. But looking at it, eTechnics with their 1080 Ti, they got a 10% win for Ryzen. Computer base basically leveled with the Titan X. So immediately it became clear to me that this is not simply about having the faster graphics card. Now, with that said, I decided to alleviate the bottleneck as much as I could. So I loaded up Afterburner, set the power limit to max and the voltages, ramped the core clock up to 2.1 gigahertz, and I got another 450 on the memory. So this 1070 should be around about a 1080 performance, not that far away given the results I saw. My initial thought here though was that there's a lot of guys out there benching the inbuilt benchmark and that's something I've always been very, very dubious about. Because if you think about it, during the inbuilt benchmark, what's the chances of the CPU using AI? Quite often there's no audio, there's no input from the player. So you could be creating a kind of best case scenario for fast single threaded CPUs. That was my initial suspicion. Now, the Tomb Raider inbuilt benchmark is actually a very nice looking benchmark, but I was more interested in testing just how reliable it was. And some of the stuff that I discovered didn't really impress me all that much. For example, when testing on the 7700K, there was a difference of four or five frames per second, depending on whether or not exclusive full screen was chosen instead of just a normal borderless window. Exclusive full screen having higher scores. When I tested this in DX12, it didn't seem to make much of a difference. So from this point onward, everything would be exclusive full screen. But that wasn't exactly an auspicious start to the proceedings. One nice thing about the inbuilt benchmark is that it comprises of three stages. The first stage is the mountain pass, where the game begins. The second stage is Syria, which is right after the start of the game. And then the third phase is in Geothermal Valley, which is a little bit later on in the game. And keeping check on Afterburner while watching the benchmark, it became clear that the 1800X did appear to be suffering a slight CPU bottleneck. Very little. But it was obvious because the GPU wasn't maxed out as often as what it was with the 7700K. There didn't appear to be an awful lot in it though, apart from when I ran the DX12 mode where the 1800X was clearly inferior to the rest. Looking at the results, DX12, DX11 is basically a wash for the 7700K, but the 1800X put up a decent performance under DX11. And we can see here it was really, really poor under DX12. Now obviously each combination here was tested at the very least three times with the average result taken. Now after I saw this, I decided that I was going to do the best Tomb Raider benchmark that has ever been seen. <laughs> and that meant playing and benching in these areas. So first of all would of course be the mountain pass at the start of the game. There's some nice long draw distances here and it looks stunning. Tomb Raider is the best looking game out there as far as I'm concerned. I was blown away when I first played through this. And looking at the results, slightly surprising I guess. The 7700K was slightly ahead by 4 frames per second when both were running DX11. DX11 1800X was however faster than the DX12 7700K. I'm not all that surprised by this in actual fact though because I do actually expect to see this happen. DX12 is going to work well in some areas and maybe not so well in others. Once again though, 1800X under DX12 looks like a disaster. 
and it was also very clear while I was playing it. Now, as I said, next up was Syria. I've actually been benching a certain area of Syria in previous videos. My reasoning here was that it showed quite a lot about what you see in the game. You've got some decent draw distances, you've got Lara jumping around on platforms, and you've even got a cutscene at the end. And again, another long draw at the end. So I thought that that was a pretty good mix. But my numbers appear to show that I must be GPU bound, whereas the inbuilt benchmark shows a clear lead in Syria for the 7700K. So what I decided to do here was bench a different part of Syria, pretty close to the beginning, as you can see even running through some tunnels here, and then I finally get to the end, to the part of the inbuilt benchmark. And this was really interesting to me because all the way through this tunnel I had been GPU bound, but right at the end you can see the GPU utilisation dropping on the 1800X. Again, it looks like a CPU limit is dropping the performance. I just found it really interesting though, that this is the part that was benchmarked in Syria, whereas most of the rest of the map is completely GPU bound. What is even more interesting is that once you get off the platform, the GPU is once again pretty much the bottleneck. But here were the results anyway, and once again the 7700K running DX11 has a pretty small lead over the 1800X at DX11, which is basically tied with the 7700K at DX12. 1800X under DX12 did not seem quite so bad, but as you can see, it's still quite a long way behind here. Now, the next zone that I decided to benchmark was in fact the Soviet installation. Even though it's not in the inbuilt benchmark, it is a very long stage of the game. And this is also where I was in the game when I stopped playing it. It can get a little bit boring in parts, and I had moved on to other games, but I decided to benchmark this anyway, and straight away I noticed a big difference. The 1800X was clearly struggling to maintain the same kind of frame rates that the 7700K was. And looking at the benchmarks, it was very clear. The 7700K was over 20 frames per second ahead, so now we're starting to see why the results can be so much different from website to website. It really does depend on the zone. A couple of interesting things here though, DX12 finally being a little bit ahead for the 7700K, but more importantly I thought was that DX12 on the 1800X was much better than what I had seen up until this point. I had a bit of a think about this and, I mean again it kind of makes sense, DX12 is supposed to kind of help with these long draw distances, and I just thought well maybe it's because this is a later stage of the game, and DX12 was now being optimised more. I'm not entirely sure about that, but it's definitely interesting to see it anyway. Now, last up is Geothermal Valley, and this is one that is very heavily benchmarked. I checked out Digital Foundry's review, and they found that Ryzen could be over 40% slower than the 7700K. And these numbers just do not make sense to me. How is it possible that Ryzen can be so far behind? I mean, if you just look at the clock speeds and the IPC, at worst Ryzen should be 25% slower in a game that is completely bound by a single thread. So something else must be going on here. Anyway, I decided to check it out, run through the benchmark sequence, including the same area that Digital Foundry ran through, and I noticed something very, very interesting, and here were the results. And now we can also see why certain websites are benching DX12, and certain sites are benching DX11. Under DX12, the 7700K is now starting to pull away from the DX11 mode, but of course the really big story here is the 1800X under DX12 is now quite a bit ahead of the 1800X in DX11. This is what we should see. Geothermal Valley has some very long draw distances and there's a lot of characters around, so you can probably imagine that this single thread is being hammered really hard and it's now at the stage where DX11 simply cannot compete. If you remember going back, I've been talking about DX12 for well over a year now, and I told you all about what it was meant to do. Rather than having games run through this strong single thread, DX12 allows the developers to break these threads up and really de-emphasize high clock speeds, high IPC. It doesn't work everywhere, but in certain cases it really can help. There is still a bit of an issue here though, because the 7700K is indeed a mile ahead of the 1800X. 34% in actual fact. 34% it's still too much. DX12 should be doing more than this. It maybe can't do everything, but we were led to believe that DX12 would equalise the CPUs if these CPUs were fast enough, which we've clearly seen Ryzen is in numerous benchmarks. The 7700K is simply way too far ahead for this to make sense to me. But looking through all these results, it's pretty obvious DX12 is not going to be saving Ryzen. But I still found this really hard to believe. Here's the thing, Rise of the Tomb Raider is a Gameworks title, and generally speaking, 
AMD has a low opinion of GameWorks titles. It wouldn't be the first time where they just didn't optimise at all. That may be what happened with Fallout 4 in fact. And at launch, AMD's performance in this title was awful. For the graphics cards of course. They were getting thrashed by Nvidia everywhere. But later on the developers added in their DX12 patch and it did appear that AMD was closing the gap. And thinking about it more, and this was before I even saw this reddit post. My initial suspicion would be that not one single member of the press would be benchmarking an AMD graphics card. Now obviously that's completely understandable. Because AMD had of course forgotten to launch their high end graphics card last year. And depending on your viewpoint of the Fury X, you could make that two years. I had actually asked AMD for a Fury X, but they couldn't provide me with one. So I had the 1070 instead. Literally every one of us are using GeForce graphics cards while benchmarking Ryzen. But like I said, I didn't really think much of this anyway. Even though AMD had caught up a little to Nvidia in this title, I certainly didn't see anything to suggest that they were well in the lead. Now I had been using a 480, the reference 480 for most of this year, but before sending me the 1070, MSI had also sent me Crossfire 480s for a video I'll be doing at a future point. So that was the best I could do for AMD graphics cards. You can imagine how confident I was feeling about that. Crossfire DX12 in an Nvidia Gameworks title. My expectations were pretty low. So first of all, of course, we look at the inbuilt benchmark. And straight away under DX11 mode, it became clear that Crossfire 480s were absolutely awful. They stuttered all over the place. This was also the case with the 7700K. But running through the 1800X and DX12 mode, it didn't appear all that bad. It was quite a way behind the 7700K under DX12, which actually felt really quite nice. And as we can see, 7700K DX12 Crossfire 480s pretty much tied with the overclock 1070. Okay, so that's fine, but if we've learned anything so far, it's not to trust the inbuilt benchmark. What really matters is of course the actual gaming. As a reminder, with the GTX 1070, DX11 ran better on both CPUs, yet DX12 was a disaster with the 1800X. Moving on to the Crossfire 480s and... Oh my god, what is going on there? Let's take a look at that again. The 1800X with the 1070 OC has gone from 64 frames per second up to 113.1, basically tying with the 7700K, which has also jumped from 101 up to 113.5. The DX11 results have taken a bit of a tumble, and this is of course something we've seen before with AMD and DX11. But it is quite interesting to note that it was the 7700K which lost even more performance, which is what you would not expect. So the mountain pass result is now even closer, on both CPUs with a higher frame rate, it's just now DX12 is the best result instead of DX11 for both. Now looking back to the 1070's serial results, it's not that much different from the mountain pass. You've got a bunch of results quite close together and the 1800X was a very long way behind under DX12. Both CPUs were capable of around 115 to 120 FPS. And with the 480's we're seeing something similar again. The 7700K is really gaining a lot under DX12 while falling a little bit behind under DX11. But Ryzen's DX12 gain is absolutely massive. From 91 up to 130 frames per second and only 11% behind the 7700K. Even under DX11 the 1800X gains a bit of frame rate but that's because the 480s are just that bit faster than the GTX 1070. But so far so good, both CPUs are gaining frame rate, however in the case of Syria, the 7700K has actually increased the gap. Those first two results didn't really matter though, because Ryzen was very close to the 7700K anyway, you just had to stick to DX11. It was really once we got to the Soviet installation, where we started to see the real flaw in Ryzen's single threaded performance, over 30% behind the 7700K regardless of API. This is going to be the first real test of these Crossfire 480s. And they did not disappoint. The 7700K gained a little bit of performance, but the 1800X under DX12 of course gained a massive amount. With that 35% gap now down to only a 6% gap when using the AMD cards. And last up is of course the real acid test, Geothermal Valley. The part that wrecks CPUs and had places like Digital Foundry showing a massive 40% lead for the 7700K. A massively diminished lead when using AMD graphics cards. Both CPUs take a pasting under DX11, but both CPUs gain under DX12. 
with Intel's lead cut down to 6.6% while both CPUs gain performance. And this is the important thing here. Some of you might be thinking, well, this is all because of AMD's crappy DX11 drivers. But that's not what we're measuring here. What we are actually measuring here is a gap. Concentrate on the green DX12 bars, 91.06 for the 7700K and 68.16 for the 1800X. In Geothermal Valley, Intel was 33.5% ahead using an NVIDIA graphics card. Switch over to the AMD graphics cards, 101.16, 94.87. The gap is now down to 6.6%. And in both cases, both CPUs gain performance. So the problem with Ryzen's results in Tomb Raider is not down to Ryzen. It is down to Nvidia's DX12 driver, which is simply not doing the job. I talked about this before. When people started talking about CPU bottlenecks, it was actually an API bottleneck. DX11 simply couldn't break up that thread. DX12 can. But in the case of Rise of the Tomb Raider, it is only AMD's DX12 driver which is capable of breaking up that main thread. The NVIDIA driver does okay, but it's not anywhere near as efficient as AMD's. This is the true performance of these CPUs when there is no driver overhead. And like I said, this is a Gameworks title running Crossfire and there is simply no chance that Ryzen is optimized here. This is just out of the box working DX12 with AMD graphics cards and it does everything that DX12 is meant to do. Again, the same thing in Soviet installation. Using the NVIDIA card, the Intel CPU is 33.4% ahead. Switch over to the AMD cards and the gap is down to 6.2%. Once again, the NVIDIA driver simply cannot break up the main thread and this is why Ryzen is so far behind. Not a CPU bottleneck, an NVIDIA driver bottleneck. And when the entire press is benchmarking with NVIDIA graphics cards, Remember Digital Foundry's benchmark? Here's a screenshot from the Geothermal Valley Village. We can quite clearly see the frame rate here, the red bar running almost exactly at 80 frames per second and up the top as well. So this is an overclocked Titan X with the 1800X and 3.2 gigahertz memory. Here I am at the exact same spot. Obviously it's not an identical comparison, but you can quite clearly see that I am getting 90.3 frames per second with my stock Crossfire RX 480s and of course the 1800X. And I am only running 2667 MHz memory. This CPU bottleneck simply does not exist. Not when you run with AMD graphics cards. 90 frames per second with Crossfire 480s compared to 80 frames per second with an overclocked Titan X. Crossfire 480s should be nowhere near an overclocked Titan X. And this is a very, very interesting point because in these really tough areas like Geothermal Valley and the Soviet installation, AMD's graphics cards must be a mile ahead of Nvidia's and yet we are not seeing this anywhere in the press. Anywhere that I can see, it simply has to be the case I benchmarked my single RX 480 at the stock clocks of 1303 MHz against the overclocked 1070 and the 1070 was only 21% ahead. In reality, that means the 480 must be around about 10% behind the 1070 in Tomb Raider. Vega coming out in a few weeks, it will lay waste to the 1080 Ti in Tomb Raider. And what's more, there's a good chance that two of them will be an absolute destruction. AMD's DX12 driver is so much better than Nvidia's in Tomb Raider. And we already know that Crossfire has tended to scale that little bit better as well compared to SLI. So for sure, we are going to learn something very, very interesting within the next few weeks. Check out what happens in the press, whether or not Tomb Raider gets dropped. Look out for how fast Nvidia reacts to this because if this is just something they've missed, they will be desperate to nail this before Vega launches. And also pay attention to what AMD does or doesn't do here because this should be a massive, massive win for them. And it doesn't end there. Recording with Relive is really quite flaky when using Crossfire graphics cards. There is a really big loss in frame rate. That's why I couldn't show you it directly. But what I did do was hook up my camera and point it at the screen. You've probably been hearing a lot about smoothness and how smooth Ryzen feels. I believe in facts and figures, not subjective stuff like smoothness. But I was absolutely blown away by how smooth this gaming experience was. With the Crossfire cards, I haven't tried Crossfire in years and I have had a very low opinion of it for a very long time. And I don't know what it is. 
I don't know if it's Ryzen. I don't know if it's the Crossfire. I don't know if it's the FreeSync monitor, or it may even be a combination of all three. But the smoothness of this was absolutely out of this world, and it simply cannot be denied. There has to be a way to test it, and AMD needs to find what that is. It's not just the smoothness. The responsiveness is incredible as well. It just feels like an instant response from the time you move your mouse to the character movement on screen. I have never seen anything like this. And in actual fact, I've had the 480s inside the PC ever since. I'm not saying run out and buy some Crossfire 480s, but if you're playing Tomb Raider and you've already got one, you would certainly want to check this out. Right, so to wrap this one up, I won't be claiming I'm the greatest benchmarker ever, and I never will be, but I'm pretty sure this is the most comprehensive Tomb Raider benchmark you've ever seen. And the truth of this is, I have worked on this for probably around 100 hours. It has been a massive undertaking, and it would be amazing if it was viable, but it simply isn't. We cannot expect the press to go to these sort of lengths, but it really does show that there is a severe lack of reliability in the press's testing. I don't know what the answer to that is. The inbuilt benchmarks, I do not trust them. Funnily enough though, the final result wasn't that far away from what the inbuilt benchmark showed. If you just switch around DX11 and DX12, and that's another point. AMD, optimizing games is all well and good, but you also need to optimize the in-game benchmark, especially when it comes to DX12. So I hope this one was interesting, and I hope a bunch of stuff was learned. March has been an exhausting benchmark marathon for me, and I believe I may have one or two CPUs coming next month as well. We'll catch you later, guys.